without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jackie Gingrich Cushman. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alyssa, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone here. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you taking the time out on the afternoon and, and coming. And I hope it will be a really interesting conversation, a little different maybe. But I'd like to begin by saying that um, it really is a thrill to be here in the Raven House office building because my first memories of this building were in the 70s. I know many of you were not alive then. Um, but if you can imagine the 70s, I was a very young girl and I would run up and down the corridors. And back then, you could actually take the elevators down and go through the tunnels without security, right? Um, and many times I would get lost and pop back up somewhere else, either in the Library of Congress or over in the Capitol building. Um, but really, this is where I spent a lot of my time growing up. So for me, it's a particular thrill to be back in the Rayburn House office building. And again, thank you very much for having me here. It's really quite, um, quite an honor. In terms of where I am, I'll give you a little bit of background about my, kind of my personal background, my journey to the book, and why I think particularly at this point in our nation's history, why this book and why our founding documents and the history of our nation are so very important. Because we really are, I think, at a really very important crossroads as a country. And I think we're going to have to figure out in the end, do, who are we as a country, what do we believe in, and that's going to really set the pattern for the next generation. And I think the best place to start for that is to look at our documents, at our history. And that's really what drove the essential American. So, again, I'd like to say, especially for the, um, the Claire Booth Loose Policy Group, I have a great little story. I was telling a friend that I was coming here, Dana Pavey, and for those that might know Dana, I've known Dana for over a decade, and she worked for my father at the American Enterprise Institute, and she actually got that job because she came to Washington to look for a job, came to one of these events, networked, met somebody, and the next thing she knew, she spent a decade of her life um, working for New Gingrich. So you, you never know who you might meet at one of these events, so make sure y'all you mix and mingle later on. Interestingly enough, she is married to a gentleman, uh, Louise Haza. Louise Haza, for those of y'all that are symphony lovers, was the first chair, the first violinist for the Washington Symphony for, for a long, long time. He retired a year ago. They met because she gave to the symphony and went to a donor a meet and greet and met Louise and fell in love. And now they live very happily down in St. Simons in Georgia. So you never know when these events might lead to a happily ever after. So again, my first trip, my first memory of D.C. was in the 70s. And this was way before my dad won. I'm going to take you a little bit of a reminder of kind of my background and his career because I think it's important for us to understand where we came from and why it's important to learn lessons. So if you can imagine the 1970s, I think this might have been around 74. We lived in Carrollton, Georgia. Now, we lived in Carrollton, Georgia because my father, who went to Emory and then went to Tulane, got his PhD. And part of the deal was he got some scholarship money if he promised he'd come back to Georgia and teach when he finished. Fair deal. When he finished up his dissertation in Belgium, he found a job offer at one place, Carrollton, Georgia. So that's where he went. He had two young girls. Uh, and my mother and we all lived in Carrollton, Georgia. So we packed up to come to Washington on a big train trip, which if you can imagine back then, it was a big trip for us. My mother's mother was going as well. And we're getting ready, and we're coming down the big hill on our little house. And it's pretty steep, not very long. And my grandmother, Mamu, tripped <laughs> and, and broke her arm. And it broke her leg, broke her leg. She broke her leg, I can remember, because my sister had to get someone to push her around the, the Washington Zoo the entire time. Aww. Luckily, she was 16. I don't think she had a problem with that. But, um, but grand, grandmother got on the train. She rode the train the whole way here, and we kept our family vacation intact. But what I remember, and the reason I'm telling you the story, is if you can imagine a little rural girl from Carrollton, Georgia, riding the train up, going into the dining car in the morning, sitting down at what appeared to be a very elegant table with white tablecloth at that time, and a little flower, and looking out of the window and seeing as she crossed the bridge of Potomac, the Washington Monument. And the feeling that I had, knowing that I had just entered our nation's capital. Later I learned, as I'm sure many of you know, that on the top of the Washington Monument is the, is the capstone. 
And on the, top, on the capstone on the east side, it, said, it says, Let us stay, which is praise be to God. So that as the sun rises over Washington every day, the first lights of sun strike the words, Praise be to God. And I try to remember that as I come into Washington, because it really is a special city. And I think for those that live here, you can occasionally forget that. But I think it's very important for us to remember that it is a very special city. So my first political memories are not of the trip into Washington, but are of the 1974 campaign. So again, little girl from Georgia, it's 1974, and my father decides to run for Congress as a Republican. Now back then there were no Republicans from Georgia. Not really. There was Rodney Cook, there was Mac Mattingly, there was Bo Calloway and my father. So you could get all three of them in a closet, right, in a little bitty room together. That was the entire Georgia Republican group. That was it. But he decided to run. And because he was at West Georgia, that meant that he'd run against Jack Flint, who at the time was the dean of the, of the, of the Georgia delegation, which means he's, he was the most senior person. I'm sure many people told him it wasn't a good idea. And Lori, we were talking earlier, and I know that we have actually have a, a granddaughter of someone who remembers when we announced that he was going to run. So we do have a really long history in Georgia. So he ran. We ran really hard. And for those that remember 1974, either in history books or from real life, 74 was a time of Watergate. So you can imagine what it must have been like to run as a Republican in Georgia. Really hard. So he ran, 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 ran. And at the end of the, the, the term, we, we went to the victory party. Right, you always have a victory party because you don't want to have a defeat party. It's really, really bad. And I can remember Dad sitting there with his yellow legal pad. And back then, we didn't have those great maps that you wand over and pull things out of. You had someone call from a precinct. And they'd say, hey, this is precinct, whatever, whatever. Here are the votes for, for A and B. So Dad would write them down. And I can remember him adding them up. He's a pretty good mathematician. My mom's a math teacher, but he's pretty good at math. And he'd add them up again, as if it would change the answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't. He lost with 48.5% of the vote, which as we all know, if we've worked in the campaign, it doesn't matter if you lose, how much you lose by, you lose. But the next morning, he didn't complain, he didn't cry. The next morning, we got up really early. We went over to the, um, the Ford factory, and he shook hands. We shook hands as a family. Thank you for your help. We'll be back again next time. Next thing, next year, same thing happened. He ran really hard. He was sure, he was sure he could beat Jack Flint. It was 1976. And he said he knew he really had a chance until the Republican primaries. And some guy named Jimmy Carter was really getting ahead. <laughs> and he knew that it was really going to be a tough race because we're in Georgia again. And Jimmy Carter ran a great race and ran, worked really hard. And Dad said he thought he had a chance until Election Day when he stood in front of Neva Lomas and Library, which was our polling place, and he saw the buses pull up. And he realized the buses weren't there to vote for Newt Gingrich. They were there for somebody else. So again that night, he added up and added up again and again and again, and again he lost with 48.3% of the vote. Slight decline. So what do we do the next morning? We got up again, went to the Ford factory. Thank you very much for your help. We'll be back again. Now my mother tells a great story. I heard this recently from her. We're talking about the history and, and the family and what we went through. And at this point, they had lost twice. And they had to decide whether or not to run again. They decided, he decided to run again. And mom says she can remember going to the local AMP, running to, into a friend and saying, Jackie, you're not going to let him run again, are you? I mean, you just can't. I mean, he just can't run again. I mean, it's gonna, if he loses, it's going to be embarrassing, like the first two weren't, right? Um, <laughs> and Mom had such, such a great answer. She goes, who am I to kill the dream? I've got, he, of course we're going to run. He wants to run. And as we now know, he ran, he won, and in time, led the 1994 Republican resurgence on the Hill. The reason I tell this story is not to say that my dad lost a lot, because I know it is still kind of embarrassing, and I don't like to highlight that. But my point is very clear. I want you to understand that persistence matters, that it's very important that we as a people are optimistic and persistent, persistent because in the end, that's what makes a difference. 
Now, as Thomas Jefferson said, all that tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. I think we need to be very, very aware of this quote because we have to understand we can't be silent. The complicity is just as bad as actually doing something. And we have to have the ability to stand up and speak about what we think is important as a nation. Today, more than ever, conservatives, and I think in particular, and I'll talk about this, I think in particular, no offense to the men here, right? My, my kids always say that, no offense. And I'm always like, oh, I know you're going to say something bad, right? You hear that and you're like, oh, please. But no, it's not any offense to men, but I think particularly women conservatives are incredibly important. Male, male, male conservatives have been important for a long time, but I think women really, I think it's our time to step up and be proactive. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So our nation is on a journey. That's what I like to think about. We're on a journey. And we have this incredible rich history, a lot of which is in the book, The, the, the Central American. And I think we have a really bright future, which I'm going to talk about as well. But if you think about it, we're the link. We're it. The people here in this room, the people in our nation, we're the link between an incredibly wonderful history and an incredibly bright future. And it's our job. I think our future is based on our ability to speak up, to articulate a very clear vision of a great future that everyone can be engaged in. I think we have to paint such a compelling picture that people want to join in and want to be helpful and want to be a part of it. We have to inspire and remind people of our rights. And with rights come responsibilities of Americans. Our future is predicated on, on Americans' understanding and their belief that we all have an equal opportunity to share the American dream. That we have to understand that we have to articulate and, con and convey a vision that resonates. It has to resonate. When I say resonate, my little girl plays violin, and when she plays, she's actually not great, but okay, she's good. <laughs> but when, you know, when she plays, and she really plays well, you can feel it, right? You feel it resonating in your body. And let me tell you, when Louise Haza plays the first chair, it really does resonate because he plays with such passion. But we have to be able to con convey and articulate a vision that resonates with the majority of Americans so they can understand and feel it in their bodies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the founding of our country that I'm sure you all know about, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And then also about where I think we need to go. I think one is we need to think about the Declaration of Independence that clearly states, right, that we have self-evident truths, that our Creator gave people rights, that we then loaned them to the government. And I think we need to think about this as what we are and what we're not. Self-evident means it's truthful. So I think we need to understand we need to have society and government that's based on truth. When we say equal, that we are created equal. Not that in the end it's all equal. And this is a real challenge for us as a society. I mean, this is going to hurt some people's feelings because people like for people to be happy. But the reality is, in the end, you have to have people that do better than others because they worked harder. You can't have a society where everyone gets the same thing in the end. That's not a free society that creates independent entrepreneurial people. When we're talking about endowed by our creator, we're talking about God giving us power, that our power comes from God, not that the government decides what power we're going to have. It's a very different paradigm. I think when you think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you think about the freedom to act as you want and do, but also we have to remember when that says pursuit of happiness, this is really important. That means you can pursue it. That doesn't mean you have it. And that's very, very different. I have, I have a 9 and 11-year-old, and they're, they're, they're great ages. They're really, really fun. The 11-year-old's a girl. The 9's a little boy. And we get into these, these discussions sometimes, and they're really, really frustrated with me because they're not happy. And I have to remind them that that's not my job. My, it's not my job to make them happy. It's my job to discipline them and love them and to encourage them. And it's their job to figure out in the boundaries how they can be happy. But I think that's, a, that's really hard for us to do as a country. I'm going to talk a little bit about what women do and why I think women are so important in this next phase of where we are politically. And I'm going to speak in generalities again. So if, if you're not one of these normal women, don't take any offense. That's not how it's given. But in general, I think women operate a little differently. And I see this in my sister. I have a sister who's three and a half years older. Um, she's absolutely amazing. She um, is probably the best 
manager or leader, as you would say, of people that I, that I know. And I say that because she really cares about everybody that works with her. I mean, genuinely cares for them. Worries about whether, how they feel and what they're doing and how they work. And what she's able to do is she actually pulls all their strengths and then figures out how to use them together. She's an incredible, incredible manager, very talented woman. But women often have that skill of figuring out how do you knit together and create a team versus figuring out how do you create a group that always competes against each other, which is a very different dynamic. The other thing that women do is they, because they are by nature, right, the, the child that they give birth and they also are the mother, I think women are much more forward-thinking because we're always thinking about, especially when you have children, What's the next generation? It, we, it, we, it's like we can't help ourselves. We worry about our children. We worry about their future. We worry about how can we make sure things are ready. So I think by design, the way God created us, that we do worry about what's coming up. We care for children, which makes us either kind of crazy sometimes, which does happen. Also, it develops patience. I think one of the biggest joys I have with having children is that I'm developing a little bit more patience. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I have a lot more patience to get. But one of the things, and I had this experience this weekend, my husband and I laugh over this. We once had someone come and watch our children, and the children were running around doing something, and they you know, were instructed to do X, Y, and Z, and the kids marched off rapidly and did exactly what they were told to do, which was amazing. Um, but they turned to us and said, look, all you need to do is just tell them, and they do it. And I'm like, right, you tell them 4,000 times, right, and then maybe they do it. And one of the things about parenting is you begin to realize you do have to be, you have to repeat yourself. It's very repetitious. It's very deliberate. You have to do it over and over again. And if possible, without screaming. Always helps, right? <laughs> so it is some of that ability to say the same thing over and over again in the hopes that eventually you'll hear someone saying, you know, they have the nicest manners, because I am from Georgia. I like that yes ma'am, no ma'am, and that thank you very much. And then you hear that and you think, gosh, that after that 4,000th time, something sunk in and it makes you happy. The other thing that women do is they create nests. And I know guys like to laugh at that, and my husband does. But part of the reason that we create places of um, safety or relaxation is that allows a place for people to be able to knit together as a community or family. And a lot of times I think in the society we, we laugh at that. Oh, we don't need a nice place to sit or whatever. But it's true, you need that sanctuary. In fact, I was talking to a teacher last week, and she goes, you know, it's interesting how much information you get when you're carpooling. Some of the, my best discussions with my children are during carpooling. I hear about what's happening and what they're doing. And she goes, the nice thing about that is that leaves the home as a place to be safe. And I know not all people have that ability. Not all, people, not all homes are safe. But I think one of the things that I aspire to do is, as a mother is to make sure my home is a place that's safe and those children feel loved. And again, I think that's what women try to do, is try to build places and communities that are safe. And I think as we, as a, as a conservative society, think about how do we build in the next generation, I think we need to use those same skills. I think we need to be able to think about how can we knit together communities that help each other? How can we figure out how to over and over and over repeat the same things without getting frustrated? Because it may take a really long time. How can we make sure that we build on strengths and we don't tear down people because of their weaknesses? Because we all, and at least I have a lot of weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. But I think those core fundamental values are very important. One of the reasons um, that I wrote The Essential American, and one of the reasons I think it's so important, is because it reminds us that words matter. I know it sounds very shocking to, he to hear that, but I think we forget a lot of times, especially when we email and text, but words have great importance. Thoughts and ideas create re reality and therefore results. So we need to be very careful not only what we read, but what we think in our ideas. These documents remind us of our exceptionalism. They all ask us to do more or to be more. They also provide clarity. And when, when, when Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, he didn't say, gosh, I hope one day it might fall down on its own. Right? I mean, he said, tear down the wall. Very, very clear in terms of what should happen. 
And I think as we think about our future, it's very important for us to understand our past. And again, that's the core belief behind the Essential American. There are nation stories. I don't know if you have family stories. We have family stories. The one I told you about my dad losing twice is obviously a family story. I tell that to my children when they fail to remind them they have to get up and be nice and gracious and work really hard again, and they can't give up. We also have stories. I'll tell you a few family stories. My grandmother, Mamu, the same one who broke her leg, um, was raised in a farm. And in a rural area of Georgia that makes Carrollton look like a metropolis. So I think everybody around her was probably related to her. She was one of either 11 or 13. They're not really sure. They don't have really good records. And she was either born in 1911 or 1913. They're not really sure. But in any event, Mamu was part of a farming family, tenant farming family. So they didn't own the land. They just worked it, which means everybody had to really participate. Everybody was involved. So when she told her dad she wanted to go to Columbus, Georgia, and get her RN degree, he wasn't happy. Because that's, he, was, he needed those hands. He needed her to help him out. So her mother gave her her egg money, literally her egg money, her nest egg. And her father disowned her, said, do you want to hear from me again? And she went off to Columbus and got her RN degree, which for a woman from a family who had never had a, a high school diploma was a huge, huge event. Now, I tell this story to my children because I want them to understand that we value education, that education is important, as is doing what you think is really right for you. Now, you'll be, you'll be glad to know that when her father became sick later in life and needed someone to help him, she, of course, was there and took care of him, for which he was grateful. But it's really important. Education is important. My mother, who is the um, oldest of four children, was told when she went to college, you have two choices. You may get out in three years, and then your sister will go after you, or your sister will wait another year because there's not enough money to send two children the same year. So mom goes, I'll give it a try. She went to Auburn, graduated with a degree in math, which was unusual, again, for girls of her age, if you can you know, imagine, and got out in three years and became a high school math teacher. Again, we value education. My sister Kathy, who I mentioned earlier, and this is a similar story you told me earlier about, about raising money for cancer. My sister has arthritis. She has rheumatoid arthritis. If you've never seen anyone that has this disease, it's an incredibly debilitating disease. Um, she, had, she had days six, seven years ago when she literally could not get out of bed. I mean, literally had to be lifted out of bed. And she began taking a drug called Embril um, and totally transformed her life. She didn't, didn't fix anything, but it stopped all, the, all the, the, the progress of disease. So my sister, having then right, conquered that, at least for right now, decided she wanted to raise money and awareness for arthritis and decided that she wanted to walk a marathon. Now, for those who are not aware, it's 26.2 miles. So she asked me if I'd go along and help raise money for this for rheumatoid arthritis. And I said, sure, of course, right? Your sister, I'll do anything you want. And all I could think about the first year was, oh, I'm going to have to carry her. She's never going to make it. Now, luckily, she's little. She's 5'5 five, five and very petite, and I probably could have carried her if I had to, and I kept thinking that. Surely I'll be able to carry her. But, <laughs> you, know, you know Kathy. But Kathy, of course, made it through fine. Walked all 26.2 miles, took her 7 hours and 47 minutes, we raised $40,000. We've done it three other. We've done it two other times, and over the, over the years, we've raised $146,000. So you really can do incredible things when you put your mind to it. But those are those are some of our family stories. In terms of our nation stories, there are a couple I want to highlight for you today because I think they're so important. One is Abigail Adams, often overlooked, but if you think about the Revolutionary War period, women weren't in front. They weren't the ones that were in front of the group. They were left behind with the children. But when you look at Abigail Adams in her letters with John, you see a woman that clearly was very, very bright, highly educated, and asked really great questions. And when you read her letters and you, and you see her questions, you think she's kind of prodding him. She's giving him the next thing to do, right, just make sure. And one of the things she, that she said is she reminds him, does every member feel for us? Kind of like we do like now when you get calls from constituents or people that say, remember the people down in Georgia, remember the people out in Texas, or remember those in California? She reminded him of the people at home. 
And she also reminded them, if a form of government is to be established, what one will be assumed? What's going to happen? How will you form this government? How will it be made up? But clearly their relationship not only provided him with stability as a family, but also intellectually challenged him to think about what's the right woman to form our government. The other one is Jean Kirkpatrick, who I think I really am very fond of. She's very interesting because um, very, very bright woman who was a Democrat originally, part of the Democratic Party, part of the, that organization, but was very concerned um, in the 70s because of the way foreign policy was, was unfolding and got very, very concerned, caught then-candidate Ronald Reagan's attention when he was running for office and became his, his national security advisor. Um, and really, her 1984 Blame America First speech at the Republican National Convention I think you could take that speech today, you could put in new places and new names. That speech is just as relevant today as it was then because it very clearly lays out that a country cannot blame itself and be a world leader at the same time. And I think, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, I think this whole idea of judgment we have to think about as a country because where we don't want to not, not, not have right or wrong, I think clearly in the forefront we must have truth. We must understand that when we, that when we say two plus two, as my dad said, equals four, it really does equal four. There has to be a standard of truth. But, but we have to, I think, move towards having truth without judgment. Because if you look at our history, we have a cycle of victims and oppressors. And then if the next group cycles over and the victims then become oppressors, you have the same cycle. And then it reverses. So the way to fix that, the way to think about possibly fixing that, is to have truth not necessarily without judgment, but with an open mind, that would then lead you to a more interesting, more creative decision that would be inclusive and allow everyone to participate. Now, that's a lot to think about, so I'm going to back up and, and give you a little bit of Abraham Lincoln to help with that. So, my favorite selection out of The Essential American is Lincoln's second inaugural. And you can tell I have, I have, I'm, I'm overweighted in Lincoln, and we had a bit of a discussion when we published the book, because I just couldn't figure out what to cut. I mean, I have, I have Lincoln's first inaugural, I have um, the Gettysburg Address, the Emancipation Proclamation, and the second inaugural. But I couldn't figure out, if you're really trying to cover American history, what do you leave out? I, I, couldn't, think it, I couldn't figure it out, so I left them all in. And when you look at the transition, his wording, and how he changes as a person from his first inaugural, which was clearly a very legalistic case of why we shouldn't go to war, but we'll probably have to, right? So if you read his first inaugural, it basically says, you know, you know, states have succeeded. We know it's going to end up at war. I don't want to go to war. I wish we wouldn't go to war, but here's kind of the legal outline of what's going to happen. If you look at that, and then you move to the Gettysburg Address, where in less than two minutes, in 287 words, never using the word I or me, Never talks about himself. He moves from the founding of our nation to the future and wraps us all in this great promise for tomorrow. Unbelievable speech. He was not the keynote speaker that day. Edward Everett was, who was a well-known orator. He spoke for two hours. Don't worry, I'm not speaking for two hours today. But if you can imagine Lincoln getting up after a two-hour oratory, saying 287 words in less than two minutes, and so short, the photographer couldn't take a picture. But today, Gettysburg Address is one of the ones that we remember. But the second inaugural to me is, is really heart-wrenching. And I want to spend a moment talking about it, especially because we're right here near the Capitol. I think it's that way. But, um, but if, you, if you can imagine, the first inaugural, the Capitol, the dome, was half finished. So the first inaugural, it was half finished. There was a scaffolding up on the Capitol. And... At that time, they decided to continue with the construction as a sign that the Union would endure and that we would, not, we would not fold. We would be here. At the second inaugural, it was all but assured the North would win, and the dome was finished. So he comes out. It's a cloudy day like today, a little overcast. And the story goes that he comes out, and as Lincoln approached the podium, that the clouds actually broke and the sun shined on him which must have been incredibly moving if you were there. But he talks about a couple of themes in the second inaugural address, which I want us to think about, is where we need to move for our next generation of conservatism. He talks about, let us judge not 
that we be not judged. Okay, you can tell in this address that he has become a man who truly understands that he is an instrument in the, in the hand of God. You can see it in his speeches. You can see it in his writings. You can see how faithful he has become as a leader and a president. But he talks about, let us judge not that we not be judged. He then goes on and closes with that great line, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive to finish the work we are in. Now you may think, what does this have to do with me? You're a college student, you're an intern, you're working in an office, you're in business here. What does that have to do with me? I often think the same things myself. I'm a writer, I'm a mother, I do a lot of laundry, eight loads this weekend. And you wonder, what does that have to do with us? I think it has a lot to do with us. I think, first of all, we need to understand that we're a nation about moving forward and looking forward. That we're a nation that wants to reach out to others and include others, and we do have to depend on truth, but we don't want to lean on judgment. Because we know in the end, that doesn't get us to where we need to go. I think we also have to understand that if we really want to dream big and think about where we want our nation to be, at least when my children are older, because I do have my two little ones, is we have to think about a nation that can be focused on truth, come up with creative solutions. Because part of saying what's truthful without judgment is the truth is still the truth. It doesn't make the truth go away. It just makes us focus on the truth and creative, really creative solutions versus looking at the past and figuring out how to fix the past. Because let me tell you what, you can try all you want, you can't fix the past. It doesn't change. There's nothing there for us. It's gone. So we have to think about how then can we be creative and solve problems for the future. That's what we're about. And then we have to figure out how we make it so attractive that we absorb the majority of the country with us, that we're all working together. It's about absorption instead. So if we're going to do this thing, how do we do that? How do we we work hard enough to make that happen? uh, One of the things I think that does help us are our nation stories, to talk about Abraham Lincoln and his second inaugural address, or talk about... Um, Ronald Reagan when he gave the the Brandenburg Gate speech and why words are important to talk about JFK's and his and his 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 statement of we're not ask not what your country can do for you right which is what currently everyone's doing what can our country do for you but what you can do for your country and to ask are we really doing what we should and I think the hardest is to be a good example that's the hardest thing that I do every day and I feel every day usually by lunch. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little, a little later. But with two children, I think you really understand what that means because they see everything you do. And they see how you ask them to do things and they see how you react to people around you or to them. And I think we all need to understand that every one of us has an incredible network and we can be a good example. How do we do this? I'm, gonna, I'm using my, some of my dad's funnest things. It's to learn every day. I don't know if you learn every day. I try to learn most days. Usually I learn from failing. I'm pretty good at that. Pretty good at failing and getting better at learning from failing. But I think one of the things we have to learn as a conservative movement and as women is what resonates. We talk about if we want to build a movement big enough to resonate with the majority of America, what does resonate? Just like a violinist can hear the notes they play resonate. So we were at lunch with Louise Haza last fall. Um, the violinist that I was talking about earlier, and he was telling a story about talking to the greatest violinist in the world. His name I don't even know. It's terrible. But his story was, he asked him, he goes, How did, who's the greatest violinist in the world? And the response of the greatest violinist of the world was the violinist who corrects the notes the fastest. And what they did is they went back and listened to the tape of this maestro, and they realized if you slowed the tape down, you could hear his flaws. You could hear when the notes were off. But his hearing was so good that he could correct it before the human ear could hear it. So he was literally correcting as he played. But we have to have that ability as a community and a movement to figure out if we're going the wrong way, if it's not resonating, if we're not building positive energy and optimism, then we need to rethink what we're doing. Because it's got to all, just like a violin, in the end it's got to all be fabulous and fantastic, and it's got to be pleasing to the ear. So we have to really figure out how to do that. Because this is going to be a very long process, and 
I think in the end, we're never really over, right? Life, life takes a long time. That's what I tell my children. Life takes a long time, if you're lucky. Is we have to remember to enjoy life. And I'm, I'm the worst at this. I'm the girl that gets on a Saturday with her to-do list. I have my to-do list, and I have my husband's. He's not so happy about that. He's the guy that gets up and sits on the couch. Right? He's got to rest first. And I know that we're together for a reason, because God wants me to learn to be patient. I'm not there yet. Um, and God wants him to actually do some things on occasion. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, but it's, it's good for me because I do. I'm very, very focused. and I, I get too involved in activity, and I try to do too much. And Jimmy's there to rein me in and say, you know, honey, that's not, that's not all life's about. It's about also being with your family and having fun. So one of my favorite stories about my husband is the egg story. We cook our children grits, toast, and eggs every morning because I'm from Atlanta. We can do that. Uh, in fact, this morning, I cooked, I cooked the grits and eggs this morning, but many occasions, Jimmy does. So for a while, we had this raging battle about who had the best eggs, if you can imagine, the pressure on those children to declare mommy or daddy the best egg maker. It was awful. And um, I have to say, he won for quite a while. It's kind of embarrassing for me, but I was getting over it. So finally, I asked him, like, Jimmy, and he, of course, is trying to tell me to do this or that with the eggs. I'm like, Jimmy, what is it with the eggs? He's like, honey, you got to love those eggs. you got to love those eggs which means you have to pay attention and know what you're doing. But that's become our kind of code for no matter what it is. You've got to love the eggs. You've got to love the committee meetings you're in. You've got to love the press release you're getting out. You've got to love the calls you're dealing with. It doesn't matter what it is. You've got to love your eggs. And Jimmy does love his eggs. <laughs> of course, not anymore. He's got his doctor's report. He and I are off the eggs for a while. <laughs> and the last thing I think we really need to remind, to remind ourselves of is that we really have to be true to who we are as a conservative movement, and also as women. I think for women, um, you know, I ta- listened to my mother talk about how she was the first math major, and it's a world that I don't understand, because I grew up in an age where I have an, I have an undergraduate in finance and an MBA in finance, and I have a CFA. I could do whatever, I mean, I did whatever I wanted. But I think as women, we now have to figure out we have choices. We can do that, or we can do this, or we can do and every woman is different. And every woman's going to change a couple of times during her life. I've, been a, I've worked in corporate finance for 15 years. I ran a big corporate group with $4 billion under me. And then I had two children. And now I'm a writer. So and the good news now is nowadays you can reinvent yourselves as you change and grow and as you decide that you have a different priority. But I think in the end you have to really be authentic, which means... I'm the same standing today in front of you as I am this morning cooking eggs for my children. You have to be very clear about who you are and what you will and won't do. And I think you have to understand that it's important that no matter what you do, you do have to, in the end, love all the eggs that you're involved with. But ladies, you know, we have, and men, I think we have a really big job in front of us. And I mean that collectively. But I think that together, I know that we're up for the task. Our task is to be truthful without judgment, to be creative in solutions, to allow all Americans to come in and join the movement, and to understand that everyone can pursue the American dream. I'd like to thank all of y'all for your time, your commitment, your passion, and for serving what I think is an integral part between our incredible bright history and our incredible future, because we are the link of our great American story. Thank you so much. Praise be to God, as it says on the east side of the Washington Monument. May God bless you and God bless America. And I think Alyssa said that we take any questions. Yeah, glad to. And yes, you may ask about exactly how the eggs are cooked. What is your favorite speech that's in the book? My, oh, my favorite speech is Lincoln's second inaugural address. It really it, it is so. I mean, it moves me to tears when I read it because you can tell how hard the war, the, the war was for him. You could tell how much he felt. He talks about, you know, we believe in the same God. We, you know, we read the same Bible, pray to the same God. This is where we are as a nation. Hopefully, it'll be over soon, and you can just almost feel his heart breaking in two. But in the end, he, he again is very merciful, without judgment, 
and wants us to all work together and reach into a bright future. Hi, thank you so much. Um, in your interactions with uh, liberal people of liberal persuasion, what are some common ground that you're able to connect on, especially with the material in this book? Um, that's a great question. The question is, what, what is the common ground in terms of talking to liberals, especially in terms of this book? And we have a couple of, um, of it is an American book. It's not a conservative book, even though they happen to be more conservatives. But we have MLK is in the book, uh, and his speech is an incredible speech. And again, I think we need to look at people that reach out to others and include them in the movement as um, role models. JFK is in there. Um, FDR is in there as well. But again, the idea was uh, and is to have American stories. But all of those that I mentioned, all of those authors ask us to be more, to do more, right? None of them say, stay where you are and don't do anything or let government solve your problem. None of those, I mean, that wasn't their idea, but to really how do we figure out together um, to move forward. And I'll give you another example. And this is an area that I think we have a lot of opportunity in. There are two, two fronts. One is uh, in conservation. I've been involved for over a decade, and my father was involved before me in the Trust for Public Land. And it's an organization that saves land for people. And I think organizations such as that that are, that are um, conservation-minded and do a lot of work and saving lands publicly for people to use, I think the conservatives have gotten a really a bad rap in terms of being environmentally aware. It's not, we, I mean, I love the environment. And God created the environment. I think we do have, should be stewards of the earth and should take care of it from a stewardship um, standpoint. But we have to figure out how to do it in such a way that it makes sense because if we just have rules and regulations, we can't control what the rest of the world does. We have to build in solutions that actually work, not just for us, but make sense fiscally, and then others will adopt it as well. So I think we have to be um, very proactive in terms of, of, uh, of the argument. Hi. I'm wondering, what's the best way to take in some of these speeches? I know that when I'm reading a book and my eyes glaze over the word... I don't really absorb it completely, so did you listen to a lot of these speeches on tape? Did you read them aloud to yourself? What process did you have to really absorb them? That's a great question. Um, a couple of things. One, in the, in the Essential America, I do have an introduction for each one. Who's involved? When did it happen? Why is it important? What was the outcome? And why, why it resonates today? And that helps. And the other thing is, for those that are, I mean, my husband and I did spend a Friday night listening to Ronald Reagan's, you know, the speech, his Goldwater speech. You can tell what kind of exciting lies we have. And I've also watched, watched the Brandenburg Gate speech on, on TV. So the ones that are on video, I think that's the best way to see it. Clearly, uh, not all of them are. You don't have, um, I mean, even when we looked at the book itself, if you look at Patrick Henry, his the first entry, I think it's very interesting that not only is there no written transcript of that speech, but literally what there is is someone else's recollection of being at the speech. And that's all the record there is. And that's where we get the phrase, give me liberty or give me death. But I think a variety of ways. I mean, I think it's fun. And also, I mean, I know that I, and a couple of them, especially the documents, the Northwest Ordinance, which is pretty long and not that exciting, um, is to skim it and look for the parts that are interesting to you at that particular time. And then to read the, I mean, the introductions are always about 700 to 1,000 words, so those are pretty easy to get through. And then to figure out what other parts might appeal to you. But the good news is this book really is, I mean, you can pick it up, you can read one, you can read two, you can read the rest later, so it's really easy to use. How did you go about picking the 25 documents and speeches that you did? That's a great question. We do have 25. The original goal was 21. I failed, right? <laughs> we have 25. Um, and it was really hard. I mean, clearly you have to have the Declaration of Independence. You have to have um, the Constitution. There's some that you know you have to have. And then that was the first probably 15, and then you had to figure out based on that what, what worked. A couple of things we tried to do. One, we wanted to make sure we covered our history. So we do start with Patrick Henry and go to George W. Bush. Um, so we do have a kind of a good coverage in terms of what's happened. And the other thing is we did want to have um, things not only that were very clearly should be in there, but things that are a little less well known. So remember the Alamo speech is in there, which is not as well known. Um, so we try to do a little bit of everything to make it interesting.